Welcome. This is a video. So my, my wife and I are just moving into a new house with a little tiny yard. That's the entire yard. Um, so it's like tiny. Well, so uh, the, so, uh, and it has cameras set up and everything, which is kind of fun. So no, this is the yard. And I told you at the beginning of the quarter, I have two dogs, right? And they're, they're whippets, which are like little mini greyhounds. And they, um, I have to keep them on a leash all the time. Of course, now I have a fence, and now I have like a yard. I don't need to keep them on a, on a leash, right? That's what you would think. So here I am. There's, um, let's see, cameras rolling, and uh, there, are, there's the dogs. And notice the little door that's open over there, and they go right for it, and they take off. Now the puppy luckily came right back, amazingly, and I had to grab him, <laughs> and I had to throw him inside. And the other dog is still running around like the back, like crazy. And I'm like, oh no, what's going to happen? And, and, and there I go call her, right? And they're 35 miles an hour, right out of the yard, right? And right around, and then boom, she fi and finally she came right back and like uh, said, oh, let me in. I'm like, you are, and then what, right here, she's like, should I go out again? No, maybe, no, okay. <laughs> and that's it, so anyway, that was a little scary, especially with the road right there. Let's see, I think I come back out again with, there we go, they're playing in there, and she's checking out the door again, going, can I go out again? That was fun out there going 100 miles an hour. So, how is he because he's male, so he's 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 like an eight months old, and then she's a female and she's a little small. Yeah, but scared me to death when they ran when they ran out the door. Luckily, I was able to catch them. Whew. Okay, all right. Welcome back. Last lecture. We are wrapping up today. All right. It's good to see everybody. Uh, we're wrapping up today. Um, and we're just going to talk about some of the things we learned over the quarter, and I'm going to show you a little video, and then I'll show you a little demo at the end, which some of you already kind of heard, uh, saw and heard a little bit. Question. Um, this is a, just a, not really relevant, but do you have a pie program to automate your, like your dog food dispensing? I don't have a dog food dispenser. It's maybe, maybe sometime soon. In fact, that would be kind of cool. I could just push the button and the dogs go out and eat in the morning. That would be fun. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Look, you guys have all these cool skills now. For what it's worth, I would not do much more programming on bare metal Raspberry Pis unless you really want to. I mean, if you want to, if you want to dig in and like do that, do do that sort of stuff. That's it's cool, and there's a lot you can do and whatever. But guess what? You can put Linux on your Raspberry Pi, or you can use an Arduino, and a lot of this stuff becomes a thousand times easier. Um, we did the bare metal to kind of show you that and to dig into the details and show you all the different uh, things that are there. But but from now on, you don't necessarily need to. Uh, to, uh, to do that. But, but you have the capability now that you know how to use sensors and you know how to build stuff and, and you will in the next couple weeks also um, to do stuff like that. So if you ever want to automate your dog's like feeding bowl or whatever, um, great. Um, and uh, you can do that, which is kind of fun. All right, let's talk about um, what did we start out trying to do this quarter. The goal was for you guys to understand how computers work. Now, specifically, your goal is to understand how the Raspberry Pi works in a bare metal form. But guess what? Most other computers these days work in a very similar way. They have interrupts. They have assembly language, which looks very similar. Um, they, your friends in CS107 have been doing assembly language. And anybody know about the binary bomb assignment that they've been doing? That's all assembly language stuff. And the assembly does look a little different. And they, they have to do some, think about some things differently. But the bottom line is most computers are kind of the way that you guys learned them. So you do hopefully have a better understanding of how computers work. OK, this was the computer we used. You guys have a love-hate relationship with it at this point, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, and uh, it was bare metal, no operating system. And that's kind of cool, knowing that your code that you're writing is what's running on the Raspberry Pi. That's kind of neat, right? Or you download a library and it's like doing its thing. But there is no overarching operating system saying your program can run now and your program can run now. That's what you're going to get to when you talk, go to CS110. Okay, if you t decide to take that class, you'll talk about the, a little bit about the operating system, but about how different programs work together and how different threads work together and all that. We didn't get into that on here because we had other things to, to talk about. All right, we started out on like day one talking about, hey, there's this CPU. It's an ARM CPU and it's in m many embedded devices these days. Oh, and guess what? It's got 512 megabytes of memory and those are like the parts that we care about at the, at the first day. Right? We care about the fact that there's a CPU and there's memory. But what sorts of things did we add to this whole picture? 
right? We added assembly language and we said, yeah, you don't really want to code in ones and zeros if you can help it. That's what we used to do back in the day. Um, and you, you, could, uh, you could do that. In fact, there's a, let me see if I can pull, pull one up. Uh, there is a, pro, a computer called uh, MIPS, not MIPS, M, oh, what was it called? Uh, why am I blanking on it? Hang on. Um, Byte Magazine. Um, I P S computer. I don't think it's MIPS. It's something similar. It's uh, hold on. I will find it. Hang on. Byte Magazine first computer personal computer. Uh, ah. There's a computer that I wanted to show you that is. Hang on. First home computer kit. Uh, this will pull it up. Here we go. Uh, Byte Magazine, History of Personal Computers, Altair, that's it. Okay, Altair 8800. Altair 8800. Oops. 8800. Okay, here is a computer that, if we have the picture here, let me blow this up for you. This was one of the first computers that uh, people wrote, that people could buy and put, make a kit, put together a kit for. Right? And it's called an Altair 8800. In fact, Bill Gates and Paul Allen wrote BASIC for this computer. They actually didn't have any BASIC written, but they, um, this computer came out, and Paul Allen went running across the campus at Harvard to tell Bill Gates, we're missing out. We're missing out on the revolution. We have to do something. And they called this company up and said, hey, we can write a BASIC uh, interpreter for your computer. And they go, great, come on out and demo it to us. And then they said, well, we better do it. <laughs> so they did it. But it was for this computer. And the way this computer in its basic state works was, see all these little knobs down here? They're little toggles, little kind of old toggles. There were, I think, eight of them on the front here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, these eight toggles, you would program each instruction in by toggling the ones and zeros until you got one byte. And then you just click this one, I believe, that said, load it. And then you go to the next instruction, and you toggle the right instruct bits, and then you click this one. And then one instruction at a time, ones and zeros at a time kind of slow, right? Now, by the time the basic came around, they had they, they could do a keyboard and paper tape input and stuff. But that's what you got when you paid your 1500 bucks or whatever for this kit or whatever it was, and you put it together and that's it. But there, were, there was nothing else like this out there. So people said, whoa, that's cool. So, but we decided let's program in assembly language, which is much more civilized in the big picture. All right, and you guys learned about, about that. Okay, then we learned, maybe in the other order, we learned about GPIO pins, which were the whole idea of how do you connect to the real world with this Raspberry Pi, right? You've got these pins, you can make them ones or zeros, that's what it is. Or you can also, kind of somewhat just as importantly, read the value off them, whether it's a one or a zero. We've also found out that it is just ones and zeros. The Raspberry Pi doesn't have any what we call analog pins, which allow you to do different levels of voltage. That's kind of too bad, I, th I think, for the Raspberry Pi, but they did that for various reasons. But anyway, we learned about that. And you wrote a whole library about that for your assignment, right? So that was it. We also learned about how this thing boots up, right? It boots up into a, uh, it starts running programs at address 8000, and you can either have it load a kernel, which some of you will do for your final project, and just run, or we've got this boot loader, which allows you to continually like install programs via the serial port, which is much easier, trust me. You would have been very sick of like pulling that little SD card out a thousand times if you had to uh, do that all quarter. Okay, uh, we also learned about like LEDs and about actually like doing something with those pins where we output some LEDs. You wrote that whole Larson scanner, which is fun. We said we talked about buttons and we talked about uh, connecting it up. And if any of your breadboards ever looked this neat, I don't know that I ever saw that, <laughs> but that's the way it goes. Mine never. Mine, you've seen mine; they're all over the place. Um, but uh, but that's that, and that's how we uh, we connected everything up. Um, then uh, what else did we learn about? We learned about C, and we learned about GCC, and we learned about like, oh, we don't have to code in assembly language, you can code in an even more civilized language, which is C, which is nice because it uh, feels a lot more like 106A and 106B type of programming. I mean, it's, it's pretty similar. And then you had to learn all about GCC, and how do you compile, and how do you link, and how do you um, actually get the object files to do their thing, and what does all that mean? Now, we didn't test you on all that for what it's worth. Maybe you didn't quite understand how the object files all go together. That's okay. You can go look that stuff up you know, or, or you can do it. But the good news is that Makefiles handle that for you. 
And GCC handles a lot of that for you, and that's it. But we learned about, learned about that. Okay, seven segment displays, that was part of the LEDs, right? You already had to build that second, seven segment display, and you had to do that. Does anybody like, was anybody like, whoa, I didn't realize seven segment displays, you had to do each digit individually, and it was all timing, your eyes just weren't, like that's a cool revelation, where you realize, you go, oh, otherwise I'd have to have four times as many pins on this thing, oh, but I can get away with one fourth the number of pins if I rely on the fact that humans aren't fast enough at seeing, <laughs> right? Like, that's cool. That's kind of neat. But you learned all about that in your assignment. Pretty neat. Okay, there it is. Again, did anybody's look that neat? Some of yours did. Mine never looked that neat because I'm not good at breadboards and neatness and all that. We did learn, though, that simplicity and clarity is beautiful. When you're writing these things, if, especially when you're trying to debug, like debugging this is not so bad. Debugging that like mess of wires where you can't even figure out where wire, one wire is going to the other, that's bad. Why is it bad? Because it's not, it's hard to debug because it's not simple and you gotta, and your brain has to work harder. This one, your brain goes, okay, I can see exactly where all the wires are supposed to go. Like everything's nice and laid out and regular and that's a beautiful thing in technology because there's lots of uh, things that are hard to figure out. So make it as simple as you can. It ends up being beautiful uh, for your, depending on your definition of beautiful. All right, there's a nice, simple little thing. That's a little, uh, this is, you can get an ARM processor that's got eight pins on it. I think it's called a, not a teensy. Forget what it's called, Atom or something like that. But anyway, it's just a, basically an ARM processor and it's got a few output pins and you can connect some headers to it and you connect things to it. And it can, if you wanna make, min, really minimize your, um, your projects, get one of these, program it up and you'll go to get going on that. There's a, uh, there's a YouTube channel, EEV Blog. I don't know if anybody of you has seen it. It's a kind of a fun uh, YouTube channel about an elect a guy who does electronics in Australia. And he actually found a place where he can buy little processors like this for two cents a piece. <laughs> and like that is cheap. Like you can start building lots of stuff if you're buying them at two cents a piece. One of the downsides is you can only program each one once. Like there's none of this like you program it multiple times. You program it once and it's hard coded forever <laughs> in that thing. So you can test it, you know, if you bought a thousand of them, you could do a test, but you run them in simulators and whatever. But anyway, point is simple, simplicity is very nice. Okay, all right, here's some, some other code that doesn't necessarily look that simple, but uh, I think it is, it, it's, it's beautiful anyway in, in some form. Um, who's taking CS 103? A few of you guys. Um, this is regular expression matching, which is um, a way to, to find patterns in text. And this is written by Ken Thompson. What's Ken Thompson famous for? Obviously he's not. <laughs> what should he be more famous for? What is he famous for for people in the know? He's famous, but not many people know him. What's that? Close. He wrote B, the programming language B, which is <laughs> uh, thing, but that's not what he's famous for. He's famous for a follow-on project of his. Uh -oh. Unix. Unix, yeah. He created Unix, he and, and some other people, but he was the driving force behind Unix. He's when he created Unix, and what was Unix all about? Unix was an operating system designed to be portable to a certain degree between one computer to another computer. And back in that time frame, they were using mini computers, which were not that mini. They were still as big as a refrigerator. But they were using mini computers, and all of them had different, op different operating systems. And it was really hard to write a program that could work on one and then transfer over to the other. So they wrote an operating system that would allow that. And by the way, it was they also con kind of concurrently wrote the C programming language, which allowed them to, to do that. What's nice about C? It doesn't look necessarily that pretty. <laughs> But what's nice about it is you can get pretty much as low level as you need to. Sometimes you still have to drop into assembly language as we've seen. But it's portable in that you make a few changes to some header files and you can recompile it on many different machines. That's a cool thing about C and a cool thing about Unix in that it allows you to be portable between operating systems. Kind of cool. Okay, so we learned about the, that. We learned about serial like communications, the UART communications. Right? Basically using our pins to send ones and zeros that another computer understands the code for. That's all it is, right? I mean, it's basically, if you, if you think about it, it's basically Morse code a little bit more refined, right? Basically one computer is listening for ones and zeros, the other computer is listening for ones and zeros. There's a clock involved, generally, and it, um, 
or not, for where you are, there's no clock, it's just the timing. You have to time everything, right? And, uh, and that's how you communicate between two devices, just on a wire, ones and zeros. That's all it is. And you guys now know about that stuff. So you might not have known about that before. All right, what else? Oh, we used a lot of get this quarter, like pushes, pulls, pull requests, and commits, and all that kind of stuff. I talked to somebody who did an internship this summer, and this past summer, and she said, the one thing I wish I had known a lot better was Git. And they, those, we don't really teach you that much about that, but you guys are actually in much better, a much better situation than many of your colleagues. Like CS 107 kind of got rid of the Git. It does it behind the scenes. But they don't really teach it anymore. Not that we taught it. You kind of had to jump in and do it. But, uh, <laughs> but you do it now, right? You kind of you get it. And if someone says, make a pull request, you go, oh, I, got, I know how to do that, right? Or, or push something to that. You know how to do that now. Good. That's a good thing. Many of you guys, in fact, Next year, after you're, if you do some summer internships, come back and tell me, did you use Git or did you use something else and was it helpful? And what could we have done better? That's another theme that I'm going to get to at the end of the class today is like, you guys just took this whole course. Tell us what we can do better next time, right? What was good, what was bad? This part of it is do the course evaluations, right? Anything constructive. Constructive feedback is super duper important. Uh, okay, you learned about, um, you didn't really learn about SH, but SH is like the shell like that runs make and runs... Uh, uh, Git and all that kind of stuff, the stuff that you type the commands in. Uh, but you did learn about make, and some of you guys are uh, realizing that, oh, I have to update my make file for the final project, and it's tricky, <laughs> right? Uh, but no, come in, we'll help you out. It's, uh, use the ones you've already got. Somebody spent a while figuring that out. Make files are kind of a black art, but you know, you've got a lot of examples that you can draw from, so that's nice. Okay, what else? Logic analyzers. The double E's in here probably used logic analyzers before. Many of you, other, other of you may not have. We just had a good example, Tom, the other day of having to get out the logic analyzer and fix our stupid library that doesn't work, right? Well, now it works because of Tom. But he, we, what we do, we said, look, there's got to be ones and zeros here that we're not figuring out. What do we do about that? Plug in a logic analyzer, which tells you the ones and zeros. Like that's the tie into the physical world. And you can't look at a light blinking at 115,000 bits per second, right? But your logic analyzer sure can. So that's why we learn about those those kind of tools. And it's it's interesting to think about that. Look, when you guys started this course, did you think you were going to get into like looking at ones and zeros that are physically coming out of your voltage of your processor? Maybe, maybe not, right? But hopefully that's been something that you've at least learned from. And if you go into like a job at Facebook where you're doing uh, software engineering, you probably never see a logic analyzer again, unless you go into the labs or whatever where they're doing other research. But you may. You may go to a job where you're doing embedded programming. You're going to have to get used to logic analyzers. So in some sense, we've turned some of you into a little bit more like double E's. A little bit. So that's kind of cool, I think. OK, what else? Bootloader. We learned how about the bootloader. I kind of mentioned that earlier, where you don't have to do the SD card each time. OK. Uh, we learned about LD a little bit. LD is the, the part that does the linking, right? We learned about linking and we learned about like where does the, where does the various global variables go and where the, uh, how does the, uh, the initial startup sequence put all the initialization in there and that happens, it's always happened behind the scenes to you when you hit that little green button on QT Creator, right? Now you guys know about that, so that's nice. Okay, you also got relatively used to GDB. Right, Use it. doing the debugger is hard. Remember the first few weeks where you had your debugger was a little green light, or most of the time a little red light <laughs> that blinked, and you went, "Oh, what's going on?" And you had to like use asserts, and that was it. And then finally, we gave you access to this debugger that you had to learn, and that was a pain, and it was like painful to like figure out all these things. But then you did, <laughs> right? So that's super duper important as we go along there, right? Okay, what else? Keyboards, PS2. Okay, so today you're probably not going to do PS2 sort of stuff in the real world too much, maybe. Maybe somebody will. But you learned about capturing those ones and zeros based on a clock. And I was talking to a couple other people who might be doing MIDI, and you might have to draw write something like this for your projects. Great. What's it all about? Ones and zeros. A clock going up and down, pulling ones and zeros when the clock falls. That's all it is, right? I mean, if one of the things, one of the things that I hope this course has, has done for you is pulled away that curtain and shown you that, hmm, this stuff has a, re there's a rhyme and reason for this stuff here, and it's not really, it's challenging. I will not, get, I will not say what's not challenging, but there's a rhyme and reason, and like people made, up, made these things up based on, hey, we've got ones and zeros. How do we do ones and zeros? Like that's what I want you to get from this class, is that under the hood, you look under there, there's a bunch of ones and zeros waving at you. Right? That's what I want you to like get from this. 
And that's what the PS2 assignment uh, showed you all about, the keyboard assignment. Okay. Uh, we learned a little bit about the GPU. You guys now put graphics on your screen. I've seen some cool project demos already where there's like cool stuff going on with graphics. And that's fun. And that's like kind of neat where you're now, oh, now you can actually see it on the screen. Um, GPU, as you guys also saw, things like double buffering and everything, not trivial. Right? I mean, you got to think about it. Once you understand it, you go, oh, okay, I get it. It's flipping back and forth, but it takes a little while to get. So your brain stretched when you, when you got to that. Okay, um, those, are, those are kind of the, the biggest things. There might be a couple other puzzle pieces in here a little later, but those are most, the, like a lot of the biggest things that we learned. And that was what this class was all about. If I had thrown this up at the beginning, the first day of class, you all would have run for CS 107, right? Because none of this would have made sense, right? You're a logic analyzer, seven segment, what, what are you talking about, right? But think about all the little pieces that you guys struggled with over the last quarter, and now you got it, right? And I don't mean to say that you all struggled with it. It was, it was a challenging course, right? So there you go, right? You've learned a ton of stuff about, about like the internal workings of this silly little processor that you've got uh, that you've got on day one, okay? And what did you end up with? You ended up with this uh, this shell program, right? And and you banged your head against the table a number of times about trying to get it to work and debugging and all that. But now you've got a shell, and forevermore you can say, I know how to program a shell from basically nothing, right? I mean, I've got some C code, and I'm going to build one piece after the other after the other. And that's the other part, right? It took a whole quarter to get this far. Right? It wasn't like you sat down one day and popped out a, a console like that. Right? I mean, you had a whole bunch of baby steps to get there, but you, you learned it all. And you all came up with, uh, you all came up with a, a console. Pretty neat. Okay? If you, I, I will pull up, or I can pull up the, the manual for this. You can go and download a lot of the early systems code. This happens to be the system monitor, which is basically your shell program from the Apple II. You can go look at the code. Now, they didn't write it in C. There was no C compiler for the Apple II, so they wrote it all in assembly language. And this looks different than our assembly language, but I tell you, it's pretty much the same. Just the, the names of things are a little bit different. But these are the registers and the very various places in memory and so forth. And you can go download this stuff and look at it and go see what Steve Wozniak was working on uh, 40 years ago at this point, right? You can go, go download that stuff and, and see it. Kind of neat. And you guys built that, right? You built it out of C mostly, but you built that. Okay. Pretty cool. All right, so back to our little diagram here. Uh, what, what, let's see, did we put anything else on there at this point? No, I think, that, I think that's the same one. Okay, but guess what? There's still more to learn, <laughs> right? There's still more to learn in that you've got different types of bus uh, communications, SPI and I squared C and um, and you now have some components, and many of you guys are using components for your final project that use these uh, SPI and I squared C libraries. And uh, that's kind of nice that you can do that. Somebody, some smart people came up with these standards, and lots of people use them. And so you can buy a chip for six bucks at Adafruit and plug it in, and then use one library, and it gets data for you. That's not trivial. Okay, so that's kind of neat. You've also got lots of sensors. Like that's the most fun part about this, the final project, is dealing with all the sensors and things. It's like you're doing like real stuff, really like doing that. And that's one of the things we don't get too much in computer science these days, it seems. Right? I mean, you get that in double E and you get that in mechanical engineering, whatever. In computer science, we don't always get to play around with like real world stuff. It's all through our keyboard and screen and mouse, right? That's it. Whereas, whereas there's an entire world out there of like stuff you can connect to the internet or to uh, to, to sense things and to whatever, right? I wouldn't be able to have a picture of my like dogs running away from me if I didn't, if we didn't, somebody hadn't said, hey, it'd be kind of cool to hook a camera up to the internet, right? Which is basically what that did. And so, um, so you can do that. So that's lots of other stuff. Cameras and so forth are in there. Um, SD cards. I did put a little thing on how you can read the SD card. <clears throat> uh, you can read, read and write files off your SD card if you want to do that for your uh, assignment. That, that makes it nice because then you could have giant files that don't fit into memory, and you can do things like that. Or you can have static files that you don't have to program into your actual code. It's kind of nice to be able to have a little storage that's, that's fixed like that. Kind of nice, right? FAT32, that's part of the SD card. That's the format that your SD cards are in, such that the computer can, the processor can read that. A Mac has a different format. Linux has a different format. But that's the, actually a Windows format that's relatively easy and everybody it's the standard is well well known so that's why they that's why they use it so that's kind of nice all right um you, there's lots of other different ways to program things right you've used c plus plus in 106b 
Why did you use C++ there? Because it's, got, it's an object-oriented language that allows you to do more advanced things a little bit easier than C. So that's kind of nice. Right, you've got that. All right, Java, of course, same thing. There's lots of other programming languages. There's Python, and there's all sorts of other programs in there that, uh, that you can use, right? So you've got this entire range of things that you still have to learn or already know some about, but it's all there. Like, that's the, the big picture, okay? All right, so that was understanding the computer. Now there's, like, lots of tools that you had to master, and that was your second goal, right? So you've got to think about all these tools and say, look, these are various parts that you have to kind of get, right? I mean, some are programming languages, and some are hardware, and some are like uh, tools that you use, like the logic analyzer to figure this out. Other ones are like coding uh, that act are actually compiling sort of things, and, and parts that get the data onto your computer. There's lots of moving parts here, right? Lots of moving parts, OK? Right? You guys started out like banging, banging rocks against other rocks to do stuff, but guess what? As great apes, you can do that, and you can do a lot more than that, right? You can learn. And the cool thing about being a human is that you can go from not having any understanding to something to be able to write something that actually puts a console on the screen. And that's kind of cool. Remember the first like couple weeks of class where you're like, I would say, I'd walk up in lab and I'd go, OK, I list the directory, and you go, I don't know what that means. What do I have to do? <laughs> right? LS. And then, you know, and sometimes I got a little short with you because I figured you should know it by now, and I apologize about that. But the point is that you guys learned this stuff, right? And you learned one step at a time, and you guys stretched your brains and learned this stuff. So um, hopefully you, uh, you've, you've, you know, got that a lot. And you, now this is you, right? You've gone from banging rocks against the thing to using a, uh, a table saw and not cutting your fingers off. Right? All right. Uh, what are the big skills that we had to learn? Debugging, testing, and troubleshooting, right? You did a little debugging this quarter, <laughs> right? There was, there was some time where you spent debugging, right? And testing and troubleshooting and all that, right? And sometimes it was hard. And, and I've said this to everybody who comes in my door, especially like advisors and stuff, who say, I'm, I'm really scared of name the class, right? And it, they, they come in when, they've, when they're have taking 106A and go, I'm really scared of 106B. And you guys probably may have maybe said that or whatever. When you get to 107, you're not scared of 106B material anymore, right? Because you've mastered that. And, it's, and, it's, and you could go back to your 106B and do all the assignments one after the other, right? Try going and writing a Carol program today. You'll be like, that was easy. Why did it take me two weeks to do the first Carol assignment, <laughs> right? It's because now you know a heck of a lot more. And that's the whole point, right? So yes, it's frustrating. And yes, it's, you know, that's where it goes. And when you get into the real world, you'll do lots of programming assignments that are frustrating. Not assignments, like real things that are like your boss is like, oh, get this done. And you're like, I can't do, you know. But you'll have lots of tools that you're, and you'll know how to debug. And you now know how to test. You know how to troubleshoot. So very, very good, right? All right. Testing, if we didn't, if we didn't highlight it over the, over the course of the quarter, you should, you should know it now, is that test as much as you can. That's so important to, to getting the, like test it every time. Honestly, writing one or two lines and testing it is the way to go. Hopefully you figured out that by now, right? Don't try to write 60 lines of code and then test it because you'll get, you'll get 25 errors and you'll go, oh, I don't know where to start. And you know, you gotta start the first error. Do one, one line of code. If there's an error, you know where the, code, you know where the error came from, right? So, so that's kind of nice, all right? Small steps. Go from a working state where it starts out working. I've done that lots of times with you guys, where where we say, wait, we got to step back and see what's working, and then once you get that, then it, it goes uh, from there, right? Use your tools to make things visible. Printf's are huge, right? Before you have printf's, it's the light blinking green, right? Logic analyzer, GDB, all that stuff that lets you see the internals in real time, or at least in, in uh, as you as you're test doing the testing, right? Um, I don't know what D and C actually is. Be methodical about that. Anybody know what D and C is? I don't know what that is. Um, but don't do. Don't just randomly change things. You don't know how many times I would look at like 106A or 106B students. Conquer. Divide and conquer. That's it. Thank you. Um, don't do the. Uh, don't look. Don't like randomly make changes. In fact, I saw some of you guys doing this quarter where I would sit down in the lab and you'd go. Well, I don't know why it's working. Let me make this i equals one, i equals two, and let me make it a plus equals, you know, whatever. And I'm like, no, don't you stop. Think, sit back and say, why? Why are you doing that? Right? Um, randomness doesn't work in the big, like, long term. Right? 
Okay, prototype quickly. The nice thing about being able to you know, go through this is you can prototype fairly quickly. It's not quite as easy as maybe doing it on a PC where you don't have to do the bootloader and all that, but it's pretty fast. Okay, uh, make your one-click one builds, right? Just if you didn't have a make file, you'd have to compile all the object files separately one at a time and, and that would be a pain. You wouldn't want to do that. It would take, take a long time. Okay, bugs are frustrating. Don't you love that part of it, <laughs> right? I know, it's, I don't know if you love that part. You love fixing them, that's what you love. And that's what I love about like, bugs, right? You go, oh, this is a challenge. This is stretching my brain. This is what I, I'm, I'm here for, right? I'm like learning how to do this. And then, um, now, I also know that you spend eight hours figuring out a bug and you, 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 you sit back and you go, oh, I finally figured that out. There it was eight hours I'll never see back again, <laughs> right? But, you, but following some of the other things beforehand, We'll get it so you don't have as many of those eight hour long bugs. But you know what? Even in, trust me, there's some, some poor soul sitting at Google right now who's been working on a bug for eight hours and hasn't gone home yet and you know, whatever, and that's that. So this will happen to you in the future. Relish it and, you know, and write your mom a note and say, I just figured a bug out and it was so happy and she'll be happy for you, right? Take frequent breaks. Don't try to do it all at once. Some of you guys didn't take enough breaks, I think, this quarter. Some of you guys were a little tired when I walk into class and you'd be like, <laughs> I've been here for nine hours. Okay, take more breaks. I know it's hard. Okay, be organized. Remember Julia Child's uh, kitchen? I, I, I'm skeptical of this. I, I'm skeptical that, well, I, I get that she was organized with all the pots and pans and things, but I guarantee it didn't look like this at the end of the day, right? Maybe she, had, maybe she finished, did she did clean up everything at the end of the day? But if you're organized, uh, things will be easier and you will get less, less bugs. Thomas Edison said, to invent, you need a good imagination and a pile of junk, <laughs> right? You need the stuff, you need to be able to think about it, and you can invent stuff. And you guys like now know that you have all these tools. He should have said some tools, too. I mean, I think you need good imagination, a bunch of tools, and a pile of junk. He had lots of tools and whatever. But that pile of junk is like the new stuff that you're going to take and create, all the cool things that you guys are going to create, and all the cool stuff that you guys are going to come back from your companies in 10 years and say, look, I'm now a billionaire, and there you go. And here's some money for it. <laughs> okay, be a maker and a doer, right? So you guys are now makers, and this is what the last, next, last couple weeks of the class is all about, right? There are all sorts of places. I've already talked to you about hackster.io. There's like, if you just type project ideas for Raspberry Pi or Arduino, there are thousands and thousands of things that you can get inspiration from. And I know you guys have already done that. But be that like doer and, and hacker, OK? Um, I want to show you uh, uh, something I've hacked on. This thing that's sitting here in front of you, some of you guys already saw it, was a project I worked on a few years ago with a student. This is when I was at Tufts University. Um, I had had an idea when I was in graduate school to take a typewriter. Here's how, I'll step back a second. When I was in graduate school, a friend of mine typed me a letter on a typewriter. She had a typewriter and she typed me a letter and she sent it to me and I got it and I said, oh, this is cool. I would love to be able to reply to her uh, from a typewriter, but I don't have a typewriter. And then I thought, boy, typewriters are kind of annoying, right? Who's used a typewriter before? Yeah, they're kind of annoying because A, like the only thing you can do is maybe if it's a good typewriter, you can backspace and like erase the previous character, right? B, it's all mechanical, so it's kind of annoying anyway, but C, like you can't quite type as fast as you might want to. Right, and um, if you screw up a sentence, it's not like you can go back and edit it. You have to retype the whole page, right? Some people love that. Like Ernest Hemingway loved his typewriter because he had to really think about every word before he typed it up, right? So but that's you know the way it goes. But I decided I wanted to get a typewriter that would allow me to. I wanted to turn a typewriter into a printer. I said I'm a computer engineer. I can do this. So I went on Craigslist and I bought this beautiful 1960s. Uh, Sterling Automatic 12 Smith Corona typewriter that uh, it's a nice typewriter spent like 25 bucks or something on it and it's a nice typewriter and it uh, I got it to my apartment and I took it apart and I should have taken a picture the internal inside of this it is just completely jammed with metal like stuff right there's no wires and things in there in there I mean, maybe one or two wires but all of us is mechanical engineer if you're a mechanical engineer take apart an old typewriter and marvel at it because it's amazing. The thing was, I wanted to electronically turn this typewriter into a printer. In other words, I thought I was going to open it up and find a bunch of electric, electronic switches that I could then put my wires on and make them go up and down. That's what I thought. 
Turns out this typewriter, even though it's electric, if I turn it on, you'll hear it's electric. And it, uh, you hear that sound? That's a little wheel that's going around to basically make it so that I can lightly touch the key. And then it, like, with a big, strong, like, flywheel, smash, smashes the keys against the paper, right? That's the, only, that's the only thing electric about it, except for the, the return key. When I do the return key, it brings the, so if I type some stuff and then hit the return key, like, that was electric kind of going back. In fact, there might even be rubber bands and things in there. But anyway, there was no electronics on this. So I couldn't do my project, and I couldn't type my friend a letter using my, my, uh, my computer. Flash forward like three years. Another professor I was working with said, you know, back when they first had home computers, somebody made a little device that had solenoids on it. And that's what these are. They're little solenoids, which are little um, electronic, uh, basically electronic pistons, where you put an electric current on the piston, and it just shoves up and down. Well, it just goes down, basically. There, that's, he said, oh, you should do that. And I said, aha, that's how I'm going to do this project. I, brought, I mentioned this to a, uh, one of my students who was, I was teaching a wearable devices class with. And she goes, I want to do that. I've never done any electronics. Let's do it. And I said, great, let's do it. This is what ended up coming out. Solenoids on like a little laser cut piece of plastic here and like a board that we, we design and then an Arduino and a whole bunch of other cables. And what this allows you to do, if everything works, is you can actually, let me see, there we go. You can actually type some things. Whoa. I'm typing on my computer over here, and it's typing A, B, C, D, E, F, F, G, or whatever, right? And then I can, there we go, I can do the, the typer or whatever. And so I did it, right? We did it. We made this thing into a, basically I could, you'll, you'll agree that I could pipe a file into this, and it would print the whole file out and whatever. It's got some bugs still. It's like all mechanical and it's not, not perfect, but that's that. So we did this and we got all happy about it and we said, wow, now we've done it. And then a little bit later, this same professor came back and he said, you should make it a little bit better. And I said, what do you mean? Let me demonstrate what I mean before, he, before I tell you what he said to me. Has anybody ever heard the typewriter symphony before? Type, let's see, you go to YouTube and you go to YouTube and you type in typewriter, if I can type, symphony. Okay, what comes up is a couple different ones. Uh, let's see, this is a good one here. I've played it before. Okay, what it is, is there's a guy who's standing here, and, or sitting in front of an orchestra, and he's got a manual typewriter, and he, uh, he's setting it all up and whatever. And he's, um, he's sitting there, and he's going to kind of conduct this. Right? It's percussion, right? So the typewriter is per a percussive instrument, which is kind of fun, right? And so, um, so I decided that I would try to investigate something similar. And this is what I came up with, which is a... Uh, the timing is off right now for some reason. We couldn't figure this out before class. And so on and so forth, right? So, so that's what we ended up coming up with. It, the timing is off. And come to my office sometime, I'll fix it and whatever you can see it. But we ended up turning it into like a little like music playing device, which is kind of cool. And you can play whatever you want with it. Um, here's another one that I think I set up. Let's see. <laughs> And so on and so forth. But it, uh, the timing is still a little messed up about it. But that's what we ended up doing. Now, that went from a project that was kind of cool, and, oh, it's a printer, and whatever, to something that ended up on Gizmodo. And like people like put like videos of it and emailed me and said, I want to do that, and whatever. So like you can make your projects into something cool with a little bit more thought and a little bit more ingenuity. And um, that's when I say, be a maker and a doer. Go do those fun projects. Start out with something that. Uh, that solves Rubik's cubes, right? But then turn it into something else that solves like lot, you know, other sorts of games, or or makes it so that it's interactive with people, and you know, you can race the thing and whatever. There's lots of like cool things you can do from the projects either that you're doing now or that you've got stored in your brain, whether you know it or not. Okay, so there's lots of that stuff. 
All right, Linux and beyond. Okay, um, operating systems. If you take CS110, you'll learn a little bit about operating systems. You take CS140, that's the operating systems class where you will really learn about all this stuff. What do operating systems bring to the table? Multiple processes. In other words, you can use a, you can have two programs running at the same time, right? Depending on how many processors you have, you can, they can actually be running at the same time. But if you only have one processor, they just seem like they run at the same time, just like your seven segment displays, right? They run a little, a little sliver of each program and it makes it seem like they're all running at the same time, which is kind of cool. Memory management. If you have your memory and you want the two, uh, pr uh, two uh, programs to be running at the same time, they shouldn't be able to cross memory streams. In other words, you shouldn't, one program shouldn't be able to uh, affect the other's memory and so forth. You have to be able to share devices, right? What if two programs want to use the mouse or two things want to use the, the output? You have to be able to share those things. File systems, there's another sharing thing. If, you, if all your programs want to be able to write to the file system, that's what the operating system handles for you. Networking, of course. All your programs can all contact the internet and, and so forth. And the big thing is protecting processes from each other. Okay, so that's the, the big thing. Um, this We learned a little bit about modes and things, right? Where you've got bare metal code is in the supervisor mode. And then you've got interrupt code in there. You've also got user code. If you're running an operating system, you have only let the user programs do run user code, which means they can't affect all the other memory. And they go all through the operating system whenever they want to do anything. Slows things down a little bit, but makes it secure. So that's an important part, right? User versus supervisor mode is all about um, the operating system taking control and running all the other little programs. All these things we kind of mentioned in class. That's how where security comes in your programs. Okay, that's how that works. All right, you've got an operating system here that uh, does a system call. It's kind of like an interrupt. It's just basically saying the user program, it needs to do something like open a file or whatever, but it doesn't have access, so it asks the operating system to do it for you. Is it slower? Yes. Is it secure? Yes. There's an interface there that, uh, that works. Okay, what other kinds of classes could you take after 107E? Well. Uh, you've got the kind of the EE type classes you can take if you want if you want to get like more detail and more uh, into the the weeds on that sort of stuff. EE 108 is a good one. Uh, I don't see EE 1. Oh, there it is. EE 180 is also on there. That's like now stuff where you're definitely dealing with digital uh, uh, circuits. You're dealing with virtual memory and all that. Um, you could take 108 right now. EE 108 right now. This is kind of the follow-on course to this class, CS 110. Um, you guys are just as prepared as your friends over in 107. They just know a couple different tools that you'll have to learn, but it's not that hard. They know a tool called Valgrind, which is, which is a memory management sort of tool. But they know GDB just like you guys know GDB. You can also do something that's not quite as low level, things like CS142, which is web applications, but it still helps to have your debugging skills and programming skills to be able to do that. Okay, what other things? 140. Uh, 140 is the operating system class I've mentioned a few times. Compilers, this is such a great, this is my favorite class in graduate school, even though I never ended up doing anything with compilers. It's a fun class because you learn about how you go from a language like C into assembly language, and what are all the little parts to it that you have to do. Networks, this is gonna get into more bits and bytes over the network, not quite the level of ones and zeros, but bits and bytes more or less. Databases and graphics, those are all, like you, if you love doing the graphics stuff for the, for the screen, take a graphics class. Databases, it doesn't really quite tie in as much to the stuff we did, but it's basically saying, hey, guess what? You're going to have to know about databases someday because that's where we store all your information and we access it and, and so forth. Parallel computing. This is another one that's, that's a great class if you want to know how processors uh, you solve one problem or how programs solve one problem by farming out the uh, information to solving to various processors. You'll learn a little bit about that in CS110. Okay, and then there's all the, uh, the graduate level courses which are basically kind of follow-ons to all these ones. Okay, so 110 is probably the one that, um, that we'll see you in, uh, some of you guys in uh, soon. CS 110, I'm teaching it next quarter with Jerry, uh, and Jerry's awesome. Uh, and then uh, I'm teaching it in the spring too, so I might see you guys. <laughs> if you want to, uh, if you don't want to see me again, wait till next year to take it. I don't, well, I don't know if I'm doing it then. I don't know, I don't know yet. Um, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, those are all the, the various courses that you, you may want to take. Okay, um, a couple of quick things about this week. Um, milestones this week. Basically, come to lab and tell us how you're doing. Make sure you're, you're making forward progress because a week from Friday you have to have these projects done. 
um, okay? Uh, all your parts. If you haven't ordered parts yet, do it really soon. Um, along those lines, I found out today, I'm glad I asked, I asked this morning, um, we have to submit the receipts uh, this week, by the end of this week, let's say. Um, otherwise, they may end up, they may not get to them, and then it'll get shifted to the new year, and there's some deadlines, and they may say, oh, you have to pay the taxes on them or whatever. So um, it's not the end of the world. You might pay $2 in taxes, but I would like you to do them this week if you can. Um, if someone wants to try and submit their receipts now, let me know what this says. In there, you have to put my, I'm sure you have to put my name about where the funds are coming from, so just put my name and, uh, and do that. And let me know if you have any, any trouble with that. Okay. Uh, demonstrations. Friday, the, is it the 14th? I think it's the 14th. B21, um, this is kind of an overview of what I want you to do for the project. Start with a little pitch, like a two minute, this is what we did sort of thing, overview. Don't just launch right into it. Say, hey, here's how we did it. It's, a lot of times we call that an elevator pitch, although those are normally 30 seconds because that's about the time you have in an elevator to tell somebody your idea. Uh, but you can do a two minute pitch, whatever there. And um, you're going to set up your project and demo it to us and anybody else you want. Invite anybody else you want to come and see them. Um, and then uh, the submissions, we have to grade all this stuff. So the submissions have to be right before uh, the demos. Um, and you're going to want to commit all your code and so forth. Please have a read me. Put some pictures if you want. And um, at the end, definitely return your keyboards and keyboard connectors. Those are the little things we soldered because um, those uh, we want to have for the next version of the course. Uh, they'll solder some other things. Don't worry about them. Uh, and, that's, and then submit your reimbursements. Okay. All right. So one thing I want to, so this is the last thing I want to leave you. Well, maybe not. Is it the last one? Hang on. Not almost. Um, one of the last things I want to leave you with. Now, I'm going to show you a little video. Actually, Emily, you want to just hit the lights? Um, I'm going to show you a little video. Some of you have seen parts of this before, all of it before. Um, I realize that the comparison I'm trying to make about what you guys have gone through and what this video is going to show you is a little bit hyperbolic. So just keep that in mind. There's a little bit of hyperbole going on in terms of um, what you've done. But keep in mind that this could be the end product. Like this sort of level of thing could be the end product that you guys work on someday. Okay? And many of you will recognize what this is at the beginning, but it's various clips of this thing. Okay.
and return it safely to Earth. But why, some say, the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. Hyperbole aside, <laughs> yay, that was good, huh? Hyperbole aside, you, you chose to take CS-107E not because it was easy. <laughs> <laughs> but because it was hard, all right? I, I, I think the, I, I think the, the <laughs> and as I said, the hyperbole aside, um, I, look, you, you've got to give yourself credit for getting through this course, right? It was hard. It was challenging. There are other hard things in your future, 110, 140, whatever. They're hard classes. Um, they are, but, they're, but, but you guys are, are up to it, okay? Every one of you is up to it, even if it does mean taking a late day here and there, or it does mean, like, not getting quite as much sleep, Kyle, who got probably three hours the whole quarter. Um, <laughs> and uh, it, it means that you guys, you guys can do it. And, and keep this in mind, that, that you guys are going into a world where there are still huge problems, right? The next big speech is possibly not from our current president, but other presidents maybe in the future. Um, she will say that if you're going to Mars, right? So, you know, we're going to do something like that, or Jupiter, or who knows, Neptune, or, or stars, or whatever, right? You guys are learning stuff now that's hard and that takes a lot of effort to do, and that's why you're doing it, and that's why you're spending the time now to do it, okay? So, um, with that, um, I am happy to take comments and suggestions for a few minutes now about the course. Please fill out the course evals. Um, there, like I said, we look at those every quarter and we say, look, what can we do to make this, this course better? This course has evolved over the last three or four quarters that it was, it was done and it can continue to evolve. And your suggest you guys have done it now, so you have the best suggestions, right? I can look at it from this side and say, oh, I think this needs to change. You guys are the ones that, uh, that, can, that can make those changes. So um, with that, thank you very much for being a cool class. I look forward to seeing your projects at the end of this quarter. And we will see you in lab and so forth. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, what questions or what comments or suggestions do you have at this point? Anything? I just want to get some sleep. <laughs> still got a couple weeks. Anything else? All right, feel free to email me. You can still use that form about anonymous feedback if you want. Um, and uh, we'll take another look at that as we go. And we'll see you in lab today, Wednesday. And then I'll be in and out of the lab the rest of the week and next week to, uh, we all will be for office hours and so forth. Yeah. Uh, Friday, uh, just uh, we're not having lecture. We are just going to be in the lab if you want. It's up to you. It's op optional, but we'll be in the lab for the whole course. Abra. Are there going to be office hours next week? There will be some office hours next week. Um, keep, a, keep an eye on the schedule. Uh, TAs and things have various finals and things that may shift yeah. that a little, but there will be, absolutely. Yeah. Good. And good luck on all your other finals and projects and so forth. See you guys later. Thank you.